Uh, listen, I'm really happy that I was given the opportunity to get in front of you guys. Um, I, I see it as I have sincere gratitude that this is uh, this. I'm, I'm able to be able to talk about severe behaviors with this group because you guys are the backbone of Maple Shades um, classroom design and behavior interventions as far as when it comes to being on the front line, correct? You guys are the backbone and that's why I'm excited to, to be able to speak with you today. So, a couple things. Um, we do want it to be interactive and we'll have some questions. We're going to keep this very, very practical. So it directly applies to classrooms and populations that you work with. This won't be a theoretical presentation where you don't walk away with the exact specific type of strategies that work. Um, okay, so I've been in the field 26 years and I realized the last uh, six years I didn't know what I was doing. That doesn't sound good for a speaker to come up here and tell you that, but I'm just going to be honest with you. 26 years I've been in the field of applied behavior analysis, studying it rigorously, curating through data, working with difficult kids in these very severe settings, it's public schools, these neurobehavioral programs where it's locked down and the kids are so severe they have self-injury a thousand times a day or aggression that requires frequent restraint. But I found, I just want to tell you a personal situation. So six years ago, 26 years into this, six years ago, I realized that about 80% of what I learned is great in theory when it comes to applied behavior analysis. It's great in theory, but I became a step parent of a child with severe disability, severe autism, in terms of um, functioning at level of capability and his ability to articulate and severe, severe behaviors. So six years ago, all of a sudden, I had a whole different level of compassion for what these kids need. And I also started to have a whole other level of capacity for what the school districts go through because I was helping out in the school system and realizing that some of the things that, that are considered to be practical in schools are not that I was suggesting. So for the last six years, I've been humbled quite a bit and I know how much I don't know. And in the past six years, I feel like I've learned so much that I can't wait to share with you because you are the backbone of, of the school systems, this school system specifically. So, in that light, what I wanted to mention is that, ooh, that's right. So, if I told you that there, there is, there's a, I don't know what this is. <laughs> I just found this this morning and I liked it, but it looks really scientific to me, so that's why I put it up there. But if I told you that there's ways, just like engineering, the way we engineer buildings, the way, we, the way chemistry is very exact science, biology is very exact, and there's, there's, they're measurable. Uh, a contractor creates a building, and at the end of the day, they see this building, and uh, they, there's, at the end of the day, that there's a product they can see with their work, all based on scientific principles. And then I step aside and I look at what we do day to day in schools. Can I just ask by a show of hands, and just be honest, the fact that you don't, at the end of the day, have something to look at, like that you constructed, like say an engineer would, are there days that are hard when you leave that day? Do you feel sometimes like, well, I'm not sure if that child's better off today than they were yesterday by a show of hands? I'm just curious. About two thirds of you. I haven't seen it happen in my home a lot. <laughs> so over six years, I've been able to, to find out what works. So what I want to tell you is that for whatever reason, um, applied behavior analysis, it's very, it, it hasn't quite yet been adapted as, a, as what I would consider a natural science. Just like chemistry, just like biology, just like uh, uh, the physics, just like the sun comes up every day and goes down, the principles of applied behavior analysis are very systematic, methodological, ubiquitous. So in other words, at the end of the school day, or the next day, if you were to know that you had basic principles to make decisions on with severe behaviors, or any behavior for that matter, uh, if you learned the details of how to engineer human behavior the way uh, B.F. Skinner did it, I just want to know by a show of hands, would that make you feel better every day? Some of you are saying no. Just curious. But it's, it's kind of weird what I'm throwing out there. So I'm getting a little philosophical in the beginning. And the reason I want to say that is that 
uh, the science has been around, B.F. Skinner started doing research since 1929. So for 85 or 89 years now, there's clear, clear evidence that behaviors are lawful, systematic, and like I said, processes are methodical. If this happens, this will happen. If this is the antecedent, this is what happens previous, and this is the consequence, this is what affects the behavior. Now there are a whole slew of things that are not in our able, for us able to observe in the classroom. Like for example, we can't control what, what happened at home, right? There's a lot that we can't control, and I get that. We can't control that the parent did not give them breakfast that day, right? We can't control the fact that the parents put them on medication and didn't tell us. Raise your hand if that happens sometimes. Yeah, why is that? I have no idea. Parents do this thing where they do a double blind study or a single blind study. They, they just put the child, they, they implement a pharmacological intervention and then suddenly they don't, you're not aware of it. And they just want to see how you respond to it. I don't know why, but that's something that families do. I learned that being part of the parent community now. They have reasons for some reason. They really want to know what parents do is they, they do this and they want to see, with you not knowing, they want to later interview and, and, and ask us, you're not your head. They, they, they want to ask you if it changed anything without you being aware of it because they don't want the reactivity of you knowing. Does that make sense? That's kind of why, why a lot of them do it. What's that? 